Hey everybody, thanks for coming and watching this video today. I'm Rev Kev, I'm one of the pastors here at the River of Life, and I appreciate you taking the time to watch this baptism video. I'm very excited that you're watching this video because it means that you're either thinking about getting baptized or you're already planning to get baptized, and I could not be more excited for you. Uh, I feel like the baptism experience for every Christian should be memorable. I know mine was incredibly memorable, and I believe that yours will be just as memorable, if not more profound. It literally changed uh, the course and direction of my life when Holy Spirit came upon me and dwelled in me and enriched my life with the life of Jesus Christ. And I know that's going to be a powerful, beautiful, and extremely memorable moment for you. And I'm looking forward to either being a part of your baptism or uh, catching you afterwards and finding out all about what your baptism experience was like. Today in this video, we're going to cover a few things. We're going to cover uh, why you should get baptized, when you should get baptized, what happens when you get baptized. And I'm going to share with you a little bit about the biblical story of baptism. All right. So let's pray for a moment. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to share with the folks who are watching this video uh, your <clears throat> purpose for baptism, what you designed, what you desire, and what you're about to do in these people's lives. And so, Father, I pray that this would come across clear. I pray that it would be profound, and I pray that it would stir their hearts and get them excited about getting baptized. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, so why should you get baptized? Well, I think a great way to explain this is uh, using the metaphor of a marriage. You know, uh, when a couple gets together and they discover that they, they're in love with one another and they decide to commit the rest of their lives together, what do they do? They get married. And uh, they ceremonially um, celebrate their union together and desire to come together to be one both in the flesh and in the spirit they desire to be one for the rest of their lives and they commit their hearts to one another and in just the same way baptism is a ceremony signifying that you have decided to uh, make Jesus Christ or receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you are committing your life to following Him, to becoming more like Him in every way and to becoming one with Him. And so in very much this, the same way as a wedding is this celebration. We all come together. It's a public celebration. A baptism is a public celebration. Uh, whenever possible, it's always best to do it publicly. If you want to do it privately, that's fine too. But it is uh, very much a celebration. You have decided to follow Jesus. And uh, what will happen here in this time is, is absolutely remarkable. God does something incredibly beautiful when He gives you the gift of His Holy Spirit. And we'll get into that in just a minute when you should get baptized. Well, I think you should get baptized as soon as you decide that you're going to follow Jesus and you've received him into your heart and you've made that commitment, yeah, I'm going to follow him. Then you should get baptized, just like the couple, right? You know, once they've fallen in love and realized this is the person I want to spend the rest of my life with, what do they do? They start making plans to get married. And in most cases, they want to do it as soon as possible. And uh, so I would encourage you to do the same. You want to make sure you've decided to follow Jesus. If you have a child or a young person that uh, wants to get baptized, basically you just want to make sure, <coughs> excuse me, you just want to make sure that your child um, knows and believes that in Jesus Christ and that he is God's son sent to um, pay the price for our sins and to redeem us and to resurrect us and to give us new life. In other words, they are decidedly followers of Jesus. And so even young children who have that de decision in their heart should and could get baptized at any time. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I guess I'm going to cut that part out. Um, and now the next question, what happens when you get baptized? Well, Scripture tells us uh, uh, something that happened to Jesus in Mark 1. Uh, John the Baptist, who baptized Jesus, says, Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, 
he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, descending on him like a dove. And this happens to those who are getting baptized as well. If you have not yet uh, been baptized, you may not have experienced the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit coming upon you. Now, in some cases, the Spirit is, baptizes you. It's a baptism of the Holy Spirit. He'll, he may come to you before you get baptized, in your baptism, or shortly thereafter. But one of the things that happens to every believer who decides to follow Jesus is not only are they saved, but God gives them a gift, a deposit of what is yet to come. And that deposit is the gift of the Holy Spirit that, com that comes to dwell inside of you and to make his home there and live with you for the rest of your life. He will rest on you like a dove rested on Jesus. He will come and rest on you and be with you for the rest of your life and be this constant connection that you will have with God the Father all the days of your life. It will never leave you and it will never forsake you. It will always be your advocate, always be there. It helps you to uh, hear God's voice, to know God personally. He is one of the tri-head uh, of God. Both God, Jesus, and Holy Spirit are one. And now you will have this experience with Holy Spirit dwelling within you. So that's a really exciting component of getting baptized, is getting baptized with the Holy Spirit. I could share more on that. If you have questions, reach out to me. By the way, I'm going to be reading from this document that I've put together uh, for this baptism class. I will leave a link for it uh, in the description below so that if you want to download this and read it yourself, you can. I'll be reading some of this. Um, <clears throat> so I'd encourage you to uh, check it out and to uh, read it yourself. And now I'd like to talk to you about the baptism story. The biblical story of baptism, where it began, how it unfolds, and what is all behind this whole baptism thing. Uh, baptism <clears throat> really stems from uh, this epic story that is woven in through the entire uh, biblical um, narrative from the Old Testament all the way through the New Testament. Baptism sets up God's plan for judgment and redemption for all mankind. This is the story of how God dealt with the world's problem and restoring man's relationship with him through cleansing and through covenant. Baptism is both cleansing and covenant. In the beginning, we know that God created Adam and Eve, and they were given the command to be fruitful and to multiply and to rule over all living creatures on earth. And they enjoyed a beautiful relationship with God, and He walked with them daily and in constant communion. Sadly, however, they were deceived and sinned by disobeying God and eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Sin and death entered the world, and the hearts of men <coughs> and subsequently severed the relationship between God and man. And this caused a cascading effect through every generation of mankind to be born separated from God. And as a result, the evil in man's heart began to grow. And so we see the fall happen in the very beginning, and then every generation after Adam and Eve, evil uh, continued to infiltrate the hearts of men and women and children to the point where we get to uh, Genesis chapters 5 and 6. And actually, by this time, the world's population has increased greatly. There's almost 1 billion people on the planet uh, by the time we get to Genesis 5 and 6. So some time has passed, and many generations ha have happened. And something very interesting is happening here. Wickedness is increasing. Sexual perversion has increased. The family structure, mom, dad, kids, it's all broken down. Violence has increased. And the minds of men were filled with every kind of evil. And so now God is faced with this dilemma. What do I do about this problem of evil on the face of the earth in the hearts of men? And so what he decides to do is a flood. He decides to wipe out mankind and, in, and in a sense, wipe out evil. Um, but he finds one man. He finds Noah. He is the one man who is found righteous in the eyes of God. And so he saves both him and his family 
from the flood. He shuts them into the ark. He asks Noah to build this ark. He collects certain animals, all these animals, and then he shuts them into this ark, and then there is rain. And God pours out rain from heaven and essentially immerses or submerges the earth under a flood. You see where I'm going with this? He actually uses the flood to cleanse the earth of evil, leaving what is righteous, Noah and his family, to uh, begin the human story again. And when he's done with that, Noah comes out of the ark, God makes a statement to Noah. He makes covenant with Noah. And it's recorded in Genesis chapter 9, verse 11. And God says to Noah, I will establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be destroyed by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. And so God promises at this time that he will never again deal with the evil in the hearts of men in the same way he just did. And part of that promise is the sign of the rainbow. And we see the rainbow when it rains. And it's just a reminder to us that God is not going to deal with the evil on this earth in the hearts of men by creating a flood and destroying all of us. That's a good promise, right? <laughs> I do. Um, but something uh, amazing begins to get set up here. You see this very first covenant established uh, by God uh, to Noah. Uh, right after the flood. So he cleanses the earth of evil and reestablishes righteousness in the hearts of men through Noah and makes a covenant with them and says, never again will I do uh, deal with the evil in the hearts of men this way. Uh, it's a hint that evil is going to <clears throat> emerge again. So if we continue on in the baptism story, we see that there is a second covenant with man. Uh, throughout the remainder of Genesis and Exodus, we see that the evil in the hearts of men grew again. This time, perhaps even worse than before. And eventually, God chooses a group of people to become his own, and he calls them Israel. And, it, and the name Israel, by the way, means preserved. God preserves. Uh, so he's preserving a people just for himself, uh, meaning he's separating them from evil. They were eventually captured and enslaved by the Egyptians, and God delivers his chosen people from bondage and slavery in Egypt. He does this through, guess what? A flood. Miraculously leading his people through the Red Sea to safety while drowning the evil Egyptians. <clears throat> and shortly thereafter, God establishes his second covenant with man, and then giving Moses uh, the Ten Commandments, uh, found in Exodus chapter 20. And if the people follow these rules that God has given, then they will remain righteous before God. And righteousness really means being in right standing with God, right? And so uh, we see in Exodus chapter 19, God sets this up and he says to Moses, now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And after Moses had gone down the mountain to the people, he consecrated them and they washed their clothes. Moving to verse 14, he says, Moses consecrated the people by washing their clothes. They became ceremonially clean and separated from all other people through the washing of water. You see this picture in which God is separating a people unto himself and this consecration that comes in the covenant that he's making with them. He's establishing his laws to them and he's saying, I want you to come out of the world. I want you to come out of the way you've been living and be separated and set or consecrated unto me. And you do that through the washing or cleansing of your clothes, the outer garments, that sort of thing. And so I'm being separated, cleansed and brought in to uh, a treasured possession of God. And this is also happening. You see how this ties into the baptism story. God is cleansing you, washing you, and separating you unto himself as his treasured possessions, washing you of the world, calling you out of the world, and into a 
relationship with him. Uh, it, it talks about it in First Peter uh, in a beautiful way. First Peter records this in chapter 3, verse 20. Listen to this. To those who were disobedient long ago, when God created, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built, in it only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus. So we see here that God is not <clears throat> cleansing us in baptism, just that outer garment. It's not washing this dirt. We're not being consecrated by washing off the dirt of the earth. We're being consecrated by washing off the dirt of evil within our hearts and our soul. Our spirit is squeaky clean. And um, so that's really an amazing uh, component to baptism. There is this cleansing and then separating, a consecration. It's just like in the, in the wedding. I am separating myself from all these other people and I am now knitting and uniting my life to my spouses for the rest of my life. Make sense? However, that wasn't enough to keep evil from continuing to propagate from generation to generation to generation in the hearts of men. And so God now brings Jesus, his son, onto the scene to deal with evil in the hearts of men once and for all. In time, it became quite clear that man was not able to live according to the laws that he gave Moses. And in fact, it would prove to be impossible to keep them and sin offerings would be required to cleanse a person from their sin to enable them to be restored to righteousness with God once again. This was a constant process because it never really dealt with the sin problem in a man's heart. People needed to make continual animal sacrifices to God. There had to be a pure and spotless lamb that was sacrificed. The blood of the lamb was poured out on the altar on behalf of our sins that we committed. And, it, and God would then forgive that person of their sins. And we see that that actually is a picture of Jesus coming to us as a spotless lamb who was sacrificed on our behalf to deal with the sin that is in our heart. And so God establishes a new and final covenant with all of mankind. It's described really well in Hebrews chapter 8. It says, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel, meaning you and I, those who are his treasured possession, those who are consecrated and called out from the world to be his own, it will not be like the old covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt because they did not remain faithful to my covenant and I turned away from them, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will establish with my people after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor to say to one another, Know the Lord, you know the Lord, you know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. And so we see that God is going to establish this covenant with, with man where he forgives us of our sins and, and he's alluding to the fact that he's going to put a deposit of the Holy Spirit to write on our hearts and minds these laws. In other words, our hearts will be convicted of walking in righteousness with God. I want to stay in right relationship with God. And so instead of putting man to death again, God puts his own son to death for man's sin. Jesus' death and resurrection would put to death the power of sin within a man, and Jesus would be the sacrifice needed to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and then restore us to a right relationship with God. In fact, the blood of Jesus is so strong that when we put our faith in his death and resurrection, we are immediately transposed from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the Son whom he loves forever in right standing before God, as if sin never happened. We are fully restored to the original image and purpose of man in the beginning. 
back to Adam and Eve, to walk with him in continual communion with God. Romans chapter 6 says something also really interesting. That's the dying, that consecration. I'm, I'm putting off the old. I'm dying to that old self. In, in baptism, you notice that what we do here is we put you in a tank and you go completely underwater and you come completely out of the water. And if you're part of the ocean baptism or lake baptism, you're going to go completely underwater and then we'll bring you up out of the water. And that is symbolic of the death and resurrection of Jesus that we enter into. We die to our old self and we come up a new creation, um, a new being filled with the Holy Spirit, able to live differently. We're separated from that old life and we're now embracing a new life. And it talks about it in Romans chapter 6. You should check it out sometime. But I'm going to read to you verses 3 and 7. It says, Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body that was once ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. And so our baptism is really a symbolic um, uh, experience where we believe in the death and resurrection of Jesus. We believe that his blood has been poured out for us, that we have been cleansed of all unrighteousness. And when we go into the tank and we lie down underwater, it's as if our old life, our old nature has died. And then when we come up out of the water, we are resurrected into his new life through the empowerment and indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We are cleansed of all evil. We are washed clean and made right in righteousness before God. Wow, this is very cool. I hope you are getting excited because I get excited every time I talk about this. It, we become the actual righteousness of God. Check this out. Romans chapter 5, verses 14 through 19. Death reigned at the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking the covenant as Adam did, who is a pattern of the one who to come. But the gift is not like the trespass, for if the many died by the trespass of one man, how much more did God's grace and gift, Holy Spirit, come by the grace of one man, Jesus Christ, to overflow to many. Nor can this gift be compared with uh, the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift follows many trespasses and brought us into justification. For if by the trespass of one man death reigned through one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in this life through one man, Jesus Christ? And consequently, just as the trespass resulted in the condemnation for all people, so also the righteous act of Jesus Christ resulted in the justification and life for all people. For just as through the disobedience of one man many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of one man many were made righteous. Thank you, Jesus, for what we could not do, he did for us, paying the penalty of sin and the separation that we were born into, the separation between ourselves and God, Jesus restores, cleansing us of all unrighteousness and making us righteous before God. Our relationship with God has been restored. So I hope you're excited about that. I just want to read a couple more scriptures uh, for you. Uh, I love some of these scriptures. Uh, Since we have been justified by His blood, washed clean, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through Him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled now, shall we be saved in this life? John mentions, I baptize with water for the repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I and whose sandals I'm not worthy to even carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit 
and fire. So I want to encourage you. I believe that in your baptism, uh, you are going to experience a, a brand new union with the Lord. He is, if he hasn't already filled you with the Holy Spirit, expect, come expecting that he's going to touch you, that you're going to feel and experience the Holy Spirit coming upon you. I remember when I was baptized, it was a powerful experience of the Holy Spirit coming upon me. I actually en ended up speaking in tongues the moment I came up out of the baptism. And that may seem weird to you or whatever, but I'm telling you, uh, I did not ex expect it, but the Holy Spirit came upon me and it was a beautiful, powerful experience. I remember coming home that night and realizing that as I read the word, it was alive. Before it was a book, it was a story, it was words, and now it was as if every word was speaking to me. It was as if Jesus was right in the room with me, talking to me. And I just pray that you will have a powerful, beautiful experience with God through His Holy Spirit in your baptism. Um, as I bring this to a close here, thank you for sticking with me. I know I did a lot of reading. I hope it was informative and helpful and you got a sense for that whole biblical story of baptism and what it means for us today. Would you do me a favor? Um, <clears throat> in conclusion of this video, I want you to do two things for me. I want you to uh, write down um, why you've decided to get baptized now. Um, Maybe, you know, that it's a change in your life. Sometimes people get baptized more than once. It's not necessarily for salvation in the second time, but God is doing a brand new thing in your life and he's doing something special. And it's as if you have a brand new beginning. And sometimes a baptism can be a point of contact in which you reestablish your relationship with the Lord for this new thing that he's doing in your life. And so that's okay too. Um, but write down for me, what it is, uh, why you've decided to get baptized now. And then the second thing, um, what is your testimony? What has God done in your life? And you might want to write this part after uh, you're baptized, just to write down that experience. I would love to read what you write for these two uh, questions. I'd love to have an opportunity to speak with you and hear your testimony and what God has done. Uh, I believe it's going to be a powerful, beautiful, and very memorable experience for you. Let me just say a quick prayer for you, and I'll let you go. Father, I thank you in Jesus' name for the people that are watching this. I believe that God has good plans for you, plans to prosper you, plans to bless you, plans to bring you gifts and increase in your life, and it cause you to live your life more fully and to know these plans and purposes that he has for you, that your life would be abundant, that you would have fruit in your life, and that this memorable experience of baptism uh, you would never forget. That it would be a, a, a point in your lifespan in which you can look back and say, God did something amazing in my life that day and I'll never forget it. And it changed the course of my life and I am who I am today because of the things that he did in my life back then. And so, Father, I thank you for these people. I pray you would bless them, encourage them, and stir their hearts to be excited about their baptism. I thank you for them. In Jesus' name, amen.